For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rudine Haynes, and I'm a corporate finance partner at the law firm of Hunt and Andrews Kurth and a member of the VCU Massey Cancer Center's advisory board. I am beyond thrilled to be your moderator today. We'd like to extend a huge thanks to our sponsors, my law firm, Hunt and Andrews Kurth, and our faithful community partners and clients, Dominion Energy, Colonial Downs, and Rosie's Gym Gaming Emporium. Last year, we launched the first of these community-focused webinars entitled Facts, Faith, and Health Equity, Justice in Our Community. We explored the what and the why of health disparities and focus particularly on the issues of health disparities that, that exist among people of color. We left that conversation with the knowledge that everyone should be concerned about health disparities, regardless of your race or ethnicity, because what affects one group of us affects us all. We were all reminded of that one line from Chadwick Boseman's character in Black Panther, when T'Challa said that we must find a way to look after one another as if we were one single tribe. During last year's conversation, we also talked about the lack of trust that minority communities might have with the medical and scientific community and how the absence of trust can be a real barrier to disease prevention and the achievement of positive health outcomes. Well, a lot has happened since we last held one of these webinars. The Delta variant, among others, has emerged and COVID-19 is the second leading cause of death in the United States as of September 2021. This dreaded disease has not surprisingly disproportionately affected people of color. Several vaccines have been developed to arrest COVID-19, but vaccine hesitancy is real and we still have about 60 million adults who've not been vaccinated for any number of reasons. While a lot has happened since we last gathered together virtually, some things have not changed. Cancer hasn't gone anywhere. In fact, there's a serious concern that cancer deaths will increase significantly as a result of delays in preventative screenings and diagnoses during this pandemic. Let me share some sobering statistics. Black Americans have higher death rates than all other racial or ethnic groups for most cancers. Black women are more likely than white women to die of breast cancer, despite having similar rates of occurrence. Black men are twice as likely as white men to die of prostate cancer and continue to have the highest prostate cancer mortality among all US population groups, according to the NCI. Cancer is the leading cause of death of Asian and Hispanic Americans. NCI data shows that cervical cancer is more common among Latina and Black women than women of, of other racial and ethnic groups, and it's deadlier for Black women than any other group. Black Americans are more likely to get pancreatic cancer than any other racial or ethnic group. The loss of General Colin Powell, a statesman and a diplomat in every sense of the word, is much more than a statistic. His death underscored the fact that multiple myeloma, a cancer of the plasma cells, kills black men and women as much as two and a half times more than other racial and ethnic groups. These sobering facts show that the road to health equity is a bumpy one with unexpected twists and turns and requires innovative thinking and more importantly, deliberate and decisive action. Massey has been leading the way in raising awareness about health disparities and is developing life-changing research and treatment options to improve health outcomes. I am so delighted to have with us today a few of Massey's distinguished doctors and researchers as we try to imagine a future free of health disparities and health equity for all. With all of this as background, I'd like to ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and tell us about the life-changing work that they do at Massey. Dr. Shepard, will you start? I thought you may start with me. <laughs> so um, I am Vanessa Shepard, and my role at Massey is that I'm the Associate Center Director for Community Outreach Engagement and Health Disparities. And in that role, I work to infuse the voice of the community into the work that we do at the Cancer Center and also vice versa, to take the research that we do and bring more of our researchers into the community to make sure that we're conducting work that is most relevant to the needs and the priorities 
My specific research is focused on breast cancer disparities, and I take an approach that's sort of a biobehavioral approach to identify some of the reasons and some of the explanations for dis the disparities that we see, particularly among African-American women. And so that's whether it's an observational study or an intervention to address some of the things that we know impact, um, whether it's cancer care delivery or some of the outcomes with survivorship. So that's in a nutshell, the work that I do. Thank you, Dr. Shepard, for being here. Um, Dr. Tosis. Sure, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here, especially with you guys. It feels like family. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Health Behavior and Policy, where Dr. Shepard is my uh, chair in the Cancer Center. I oversee an office that is called Cashman Area Data Access and Alignment, and I know that we are going to talk a bit about that um, uh, later. And the whole goal of the office is really to provide data to inform um, you know, our internal and external stakeholders on what are the risk factors and um, other issues that our community is facing and help guide our research and outreach agenda to address those. Thank you, Dr. Tosis, and happy to be a part of your family. Um, Dr. Trevino, can you let us know what you do at Massey? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Jose Trevino. I'm the uh, current chair of the Division of Surgical Oncology here at VCU, as well as the Surgeon in Chief for Massey Cancer Center. Uh, I have uh, kind of wear multiple hats here uh, on top of the administrative roles uh, in the Division and Department of Surgery, as well as the Cancer Center. I also uh, perform mostly surgery and pancreatic biliary diseases, uh, primarily pancreatic cancer. And then I have a, an entire basic and translational lab looking at molecular mechanisms of, of, of therapies or, or targeted therapies or development of targeted therapies for these patient uh, populations. Thank you, Dr. Firmino. And I know you all have very busy lives and you're saving lots of lives in what you do. So thank you for the time spent today talking with us a bit about health disparities. Um, Dr. Shepard, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit last year. Um, I think we all need a refresher because this past year has been long. Um, can you tell us <laughs> what are health disparities and what does it really mean to achieve health equity for all? Wow. So when we think about a health disparity, it's more than a difference. It's not just, oh, these two groups are different. Someone's taller, shorter, they live in different places. When we think about health disparities, it really is a, a disproportionate difference in one group versus the other. So for example, one group, the statistics that you talked about earlier, that African-American women um, are more likely to die from their breast cancer than white women. So that is a disparity. And it could be a racial ethnic disparity. There are disparities by um, geography. Um, we see differences in rural versus urban populations, depending on um, what we're examining. Sometimes it favors one entity versus the other. So we think about disparities um, in the incidence, um, the mortality, morbidity, um, and also it could be a relationship to sort of um, access and other factors when we're looking at um, and comparing groups. When it comes to equity, I know we, we that term feels better to say health equity disparities. We don't want to talk about disparities anymore. That's, but we can't get to equity until we address disparities. And um, equity to me would be that that's um, our aspirational goal, right? So that we don't see differences between groups. Um, that every group has the likelihood that they're diagnosed with cancer to survive, regardless of where they live, what they look like, how they identify in terms of their gender or any other way um, that may relate to that individual. So that's health equity is where we wanna go, but we can't get there until we um, deal with disparities. Um, and it's sometimes in addressing disparities, it'll cause us to think about our own beliefs, what we do. It may challenge a lot of who we are. Um, and so that's where sometimes it can feel uh, less comfortable to, to talk about disparities. Well, thank you for making that distinction. Um, and as the title of this program is, the road to health equity, like you said, it's, it's, it's our, our ultimate destination where we want to go, but, you know, there are twists, turns, hopefully not too many U-turns, you know, <laughs> but thank you for that. Um, would you mind explaining what clinical trials are and how they could be used to help address health disparities? Absolutely, absolutely. So when we think about 
clinical trials. Most people, if they think about being a patient, and so um, there's different types of clinical research, but specifically a clinical trial, typically we, it's a study where we may be saying one group will receive some sort of intervention and another group may receive a, a different intervention or maybe what's usual care. A lot of times when we think about clinical trials, specifically we're thinking about therapeutic trials where we're testing the efficacy of um, an inter a therapeutic intervention, particularly within the cancer space. What's important there is that when we are doing that sort of test between more than one treatment um, or usual care, that the trial, whatever is the comparison or the new thing, um, you will always get the gold standard. So, it, so it's not, um, by the time we get to humans, you know, this isn't the first type of test that's coming, you know, the first time we, we you know, we've seen this drug. Um, lots of other things have happened. And, um, and individuals that if they get assigned to the, so the intervention or the therapeutic intervention, they're gonna get all of the gold standard, all the stuff that we know that works and then some. So it's like that whipped cream and cherry on top. Um, and so again, clinical research, um, it's not, and clinical trials aren't always therapeutic. Sometimes it could be, you know, we've got this device that we want to assess its use, or we have a, a decision support tool that we think will help um, patients, for example, diagnose with prostate cancer, make an informed decision or communicate with their provider. So different types of trials, but when we talk about clinical trials, we are typically talking about, we're comparing um, the, the, either the effectiveness or the efficacy of two different things um, within a, a patient population. Thank you very much for that exp explanation. Um, let's pivot to Dr. Trevino. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> um, Dr. Trevino, um, we all know that you've done a lot of research on the lack of diversity in clinical trials, particularly for pancreatic cancer. Can you speak more about your findings? I think you alluded to them a little bit in your introduction and, and why diversity in clinical trials is critical to identifying better treatment options and actually improving patient outcomes. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're gonna, we, we, you're gonna spend an hour talking about this, but I'll try to limit it as best as I can. So, I mean, everything I do, and, and I try to tell my my trainees and mentees that whatever you do in this life, make sure you have a passion for it and and, and have an understanding for it. Um, a lot of people um, look at research, and I won't, I won't stay too long on this, but I think it's an important topic. They look at research as something to do, and, and they kind of grasp a topic, and they kind of try to develop it. And I always say, it has to come from your heart. And I'll tell you that my my belief in my research in, in health disparities started when I was in the clinics. I mean, it's really simple. I see patients with pancreatic cancer and seeing the majority of, of, of patients that were coming through were primarily white. And those were the ones that were being offered surgery. And then every once in a while, I got a black patient who was not. And so we started to ask the question as to whether or not, well, is this, this is an important topic? Is this something we need to address, look at? Because is it is it just because blacks aren't coming to these major academic centers to try to get the best care or they're just they're they they have something else going on and so when we started looking at numbers we were pretty shocked to know and and i think this is kind of where it all started to, to understand that blacks were just not getting to our clinics because they weren't being offered a, poten a, a potential for cure and not because they weren't being offered it it just they weren't offered it because their disease was so advanced and so we start asking the questions as to why is it that patients are having, black patients are having more advanced disease with pancreatic cancer than others? Are we not picking it up? Is this socioeconomics? Are there multiple factors that are contributing to this? And we, and we started looking at this and when we controlled all variables that we could, socioeconomics, et cetera, we realized that there was a lot of biology that was taking place. In other words, who I am is not who you are. And the way God made us, although equal in most ways, we're really special in how we were made. And, and our ethnicity and our race makes us even more special. And so when we started looking at biology and started look, diving into genes and proteins, we started realizing that, again, we all have a different somewhat makeup. And why is that important? So why did I go through all this to get to the point of asking why is it clinical trials are so important, especially minority populations? Is it because if we're all different and we're all using similar drugs for all these, for all of us, including white, black, Latinx, whatever, whatever, Asian, all these patients, we could be selecting a drug that might not affect, might not affect certain populations. And so 
let me give you the best example I can give you to put, put this into perspective. For 30, 40 years, we've been using drugs that have been very similar um, throughout, throughout in, in the courses of pancreatic cancer therapies. And we've done hundreds of clinical trials. And if I tell you that those clinical trials are mostly based off of white, mostly male, white men with this cancer, we're really excluding a certain population. And so keep that thought and say, so we use drug X and that drug X doesn't work in 99% of the white males that are that have pancreatic cancer in this clinical trial. That is never to say that that drug wouldn't have an effect on the black or the Latinx patients. But we can't determine that because we don't have these patients in the trials. And so it becomes an incredibly important topic because as I said earlier, if you believe what I say that we're biologically all different and our tumors are different and we have different targets within our own body, we might be throwing away a ton of great drugs because we're just selecting out the drugs that are working only in white males per se. And so we are pushing for this because even the major governing bodies here in this country, the NIH, the NCI are saying, whoa, wait, all our clinical trials, we are completely so biased toward one race and to some degree gender. And so we will never know whether or not the, the, the Latinx patient from Miami is going to be better, better treated with certain drugs versus the Latinx patient from San Diego, which again, within their own race and ethnicity are diverse. Because we can't say that a, that a Latinx patient from Miami is going to have very similar genes to a Latinx patient from San Diego. So again, the importance of diversity in these trials helps us understand how many, how we can look at the biology of a tumor and how it can be effective. And so it's it's incredibly important that we do that and, and incredibly important that we look at the diversification of this. And we, we, we're pushing it without question. Well, Dr. Trevino, I understand more so than ever that the fact that we are different biologically, geographically, all of this plays a part in, you know, how we would, you know, respond, like you said, to different treatments. But let's push this a little further, like, okay, so we know diversity is a problem, right, in terms of, 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 of who's participating in these trials. What are some additional, what are some challenges in, try, in trying to, you know, make these trials more diverse and more inclusive of the general yeah. population? And that's, and that's a great question. And as I rub my eyes, because I'll tell you that, <laughs> again, I mean, think about this, think about what comorbidities, and we're going to just start, what, what diseases affect certain populations more than others, okay? And if you think of it that way, you can say, okay, well, Blacks do have to some degree a higher level of diabetes. They do have a higher level of hypertension. They do have a higher level of other diseases that maybe to some degree whites don't. Again, maybe biology, maybe it's our, our environment, maybe it's our diet, maybe it's how we, we, know we were raised, whatever the case. And how do people get chosen for clinical trials? Eligibility is what we call it. We say, you are going to be eligible for this trial. We're going to put you in there. And if I tell you that there's, there's, there's patients that, let's say, for instance, and I'll give you one example, have HIV in the year 2021. In some clinical trials, you will be excluded because of your HIV status in the year 2021. And that makes no sense to me because we have got such a handle on HIV and HIV is a very manageable disease process why are we being excluded? And diabetes, another one. Certain populations are affected by diabetes more than others, but we will exclude those patients based upon the criteria of these trials. And so we want to say, and when you talk to medical oncologists, some will say, well, yeah, I don't want the, a, a diabetic on my trial because it's not going to come out well. Well, another one will say, no, 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 bring them on. We will manage their sugars and we'll get them on because it's necessary to bring the diversity in these patients. And so we are proposing that we change the way we look at things because the, the simple black and white isn't gonna fit for all of us. We're not all gonna be these healthy people walking through the door with cancer. And if we don't get treated, we die. So it's really a simple concept that we have to look at eligibility as one. The other one is getting them through the door. It's convincing people that clinical trials are, as Dr. Shepard said, the plus from this. We still get the standard. You still get the best, but you get the best plus, and we get to learn more about it. 
And um, and I, I will tell you the one final thing that that I think is incredibly important as well, on top of everything that I said. I mean, I could I could give you 30 more reasons how we could do this, but the one thing is diversifying our medical oncology group. When somebody sees a black medical oncologist or a Latinx medical oncologist, I don't care what anybody says, the perception of a patient changes a bit and it allows for the understanding of the cultural similarities that will make you comfortable enough to say, he'll understand that I have problems with this, this, and this, and it will make me feel more comfortable being a part of this. So while we're not only looking at the diversification of patients' clinical trials, we have to look at the diversification of, of everybody, including in the medical in the medical field that delivers these, these, these practices, because I think that's incredibly important. So promoting that to support that, to support young faculty members to get to this level or medical students or residents, whoever they choose to be, to choose oncology and to be there to diversify this field. I totally agree with you that representation matters everywhere in every sphere. And I think that will um, help us along that road to health equity. But let's step back for a moment. Um, and I want to get Dr. Tosis and Dr. Shepard in, in this conversation. Like, well, what do you think could be done more from the perspective of medical institutions, scientific institutions, to make trials more diverse and inclusive? I'll let Dr. Tosa start, or, or, or since I'm talking, because <laughs> we. Well, I, don't, I don't like to tinker these eligibility standards yeah, based on yeah. what Dr. Trevino said, but yeah, yeah, who yeah. am I? I don't know anything. So tell me, Dr. Tosa, what should, what should medical. You go first, I'll go second. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, I, I think that what I was going to, some of the things I was going to suggest, Dr. Trevino talked about them, but I guess I, want, I can share a bit more from my perspective as an epidemiologist that these sort of antiquated, um, in a sense, eligibility criteria that are overly strict, right? They're, they're just that, they're antiquated. And so in a sense, I, I think we need to address that more at the systemic level rather than at the individual um, you know, trial level, right? Because one of the things that happens is that you, as an investigator, you wanna put together a clinical trial and you wanna, in a sense, make your life easier. Like when the trial is reviewed, it's not, it's not ill-intended, right? But there's a certain criteria you wanna increase what's called internal and external validity of your results or whatever. And so it's easier to expose certain patient populations. So I think, um, you know, we just need to, it's the whole concept of the impossible just takes a little longer, right? Like let's just, you know, be a bit more expansive in our, in our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Let's be, you know, there, there's a number of recommendations that just recently came uh, out of the American um, Association for Cancer Research in the report. They talked a bit about considering things like adaptive trial design to start like with a narrow patient population and then later broaden the inclusion as data comes, right? To do, um, you know, include broader participation and secondary, what are called efficacy and safety analyses. So, you know, there's a number of opportunities. And I think that internally us as researchers and, um, you know, as, as the executioners of these clinical trials really need to have a, a deeper conversation um, about it. I think externally, I remember, um, I think I was in another talk and somebody said, and I really love this, that you know, clinical trials are tomorrow's greatest discoveries and greatest drugs available to you today. And I think for me personally, I think about my mother and I remember, I think it was in her second or third cancer diagnosis, I can't remember, she was offered a clinical trial many years ago. And I, who am in the medical field and the research field, was very concerned about it and wasn't really um, necessarily, you know, interested. And I wish that somebody would have put it to me that way back then. I think I would have, um, you know, perhaps encouraged her differently around, you know, uh, sort of entering a clinical trial. Now, I think the other uh, things that we haven't mentioned is, of course, what are we doing to reduce the barriers for um, folks to be part of the clinical trial? So, for example, you know, oftentimes if you live in, uh, you know, Brunswick or in Martinsville and the clinical trials here at VCU, I mean, it's going to be a little hard for you to get here. And so, you know, I know VCU in particular has what I call some co-located sites, perhaps. And, you know, what are we doing also to uh, bring clinical trials to the people? Um, you know, how are we rethinking the way that we design clinical trials so that we can, uh, you know, instead of them having to come to an infusion, is there a way that we can bring the infusions to them, you know, and that may be, you know, sort of naive and, and a little hard and not available for all trials, but perhaps it could be for some trials. And I think the final thought that I would have here around representation, I think, um, you know, often examples are useful. 
I'm sure that a lot of the audience is familiar with the Ambien drug, right? That is, you know, to help with sleep. And so, you know, the Ambien drug, when it was first released, a lot of people don't know that they were, there was a lot of trouble. There were a lot of women that were having car accidents and were having a lot of drowsiness because when that trial was developed, there was very low participation for women. So when it was released to the market, the dosage was wrong for women. So that's one example. So forget race and ethnicity, right? This one is right. an example of gender. So similarly, uh, you know, the same goes for race and ethnicity. I think those are some of my thoughts. No, oh, those are all great thoughts. And, and Dr. Shepard, I was going to ask you to help us sort of elaborate more on what you think could be done engaging with the community to improve diversity and inclusion um, of clinical trials. What are your sure. thoughts? There? Sure. So, so I think that it shouldn't be um, a new or foreign concept. And so there are there when you do sort of general education about certain topics, you know, there are certain things that on TV everybody would know. You know, when Angela Jolie, for example, made a decision. Um, the world sort of knew and then it started conversations. And so I think, unfortunately, you know, we have an ivory tire, um, tower sort of concept. And, and so we don't really go out, I'm speaking sort of broadly, into the community until we sort of need something. And so we know how good information can travel. And so I think it's building the relationships, you know, when there's not a crisis, um, having a continued presence in the community, um, being a trusted source for information so that, you know, when you're not trying to get me to do something, I can come and learn about pancreatic cancer from Dr. Trevino. Um, so I think those things are very important. And I think when we bring in community members or we do things to engage them, who they're seeing matters. And so some of the things that we know, the eligibility criteria, we've known that for a long time. And it, you know, I, I, there's a paper, I can't remember how many years ago if folks wrote about it, that people weren't asked, and this is what looking at um, African-American patients, they weren't asked about participation. Had they been asked, many of them said they would have participated. And then the eligibility criteria um, would have made them unable to participate. So how are we, when we learn something, how are we implementing that? So at the end of the day, we'll have to decide, are we going to continue to sort of rediscover things that people have been writing and talking about? And how are we having that diversity that's important? So are our teams diverse? And, and one of the last things I'll just say related to that, some of the things that we've found in, in our, some of our work and other studies is that that relationship with that healthcare facility and that healthcare provider matter. And when people have a strong therapeutic relationship, they may not trust the system or those people over there, but if they have that good relationship with their provider, they are more likely to say yes to trial. So we can do something about it. You know, we can address barriers and look at policies. And we can also look at how we're funding the protocols. Because at the end of the day, when Dr. Tosa sort of talked about people want the pristine trials and they, you know, they're, they're saying what their racial ethnic group is going to be made upon, people review those protocols. And so for the people reviewing the protocols, whether they're funders or it's the, you know, some other entity, are we saying, wait a minute, you need to have a higher representation of women. You need right. to make sure you have African-Americans and Latinx in these trials, not just to compare white versus other, but to be able to do analyses to see how does the toxicity vary? So again, I think that we, we have some tools that we can utilize and we raise the expectation that there may be some trials where you actually oversample certain groups, right? And that we're not just satisfied, you know, sort of with, with the minimum. I think I the question on, oh, go ahead, Dr. I just can quickly expand on something that Dr. Shepard and I think Dr. Trevino touched on as well, is this concept of trust, right? Because we talk a lot about, um, you know, working to increase trust from our communities to us. But I think there's this new movement that, um, you know, I know you guys have heard Dr. Wynn talk about, he, he now often brings up, which is the concept of trustworthiness, right? So, you know, trust being us receiving and trustworthiness is, you know, us, our ability to earn your trust. And so I think that just like Dr. Shepard alluded to the fact that, you know, it's not just you participating in clinical trials, it's us as an institution when we're reviewing, when we're developing the trials, we have to rethink the inclusion criteria where, you know, um, you know, sort of kind of push ourselves internally in the same way we have to push ourselves, you know, to think about how we are building trust with our community. Are we trustworthy? 
So these kinds of conversations that we're having, us coming together with you to talk directly with the community is an example of you know, us as researchers, as investigators, as clinicians, trying to increase our trustworthiness so that when you know, a, an individual, or perhaps a clinical trial is available to someone that they may be more likely to enroll. Absolutely. But, you know, there is an article years ago when, you know, we were starting to collect information about trust in the community. They talked about a healthy mistrust. So I know personally, so that, you know, I think that we should have a healthy mistrust. We, should, we want people to, um, to ask questions. We don't want people to blindly trust any of us, you know, although, you know, we're family and we know each other, but we want individuals to ask questions and to challenge because that's also how we sort of get to the next level. So this idea of a healthy mistrust and institutions becoming, you know, trustworthy and, and thinking about that, um, it's also going to require us to do some work, right? It's going to require us to look at our own biases. A lot of times I've seen people make assumptions that certain people would not participate in trial um, and based on how they looked. You know, they look like they didn't have resources and, you know, not here in the Richmond area, but in some other places, you know, we went back and forth with some people would say, oh, no, no, don't do that. They won't participate or they wouldn't even approach them, you know, so that opportunity to ask and then also looking at maybe we have some biases ourselves, um, you know, sort of regardless of what we look like, maybe we're assuming that somebody will not be able to adhere or somebody. And so we're not even giving people the opportunity. And so I think that that whole idea of, um, you know, implicit, ex explicit biases um, that someone sort of asked about um, is very real. I I've seen it um, in operation and, you know, was able to say, you know what, at your center, um, where most of your patients are a particular race and ethnicity, a, they were not all on the same type of health insurance because we were sort of taking health insurance and race and making that be the same. Uh, and um, like, you know, and so, but we also had um, four, in this study, it was African-American women. There was a, a range of education levels. So again, look at the assumptions that sometimes people were making and we had very high consent rates and that got back to the team members that we had that were approaching people that were trained and, and had great interpersonal skills and were trained to be culturally relevant. Um, I particularly like the question that came through that you, you just answered, but it talked a, a lot about how we're always focused on patients being distrustful, but not taking a look at the fact that providers, as Dr. Tosa said, are trustworthy and they're not creating environments of trust, right? Um, it's a two, trust is a two-way street, as we know in all types of relationships, right? Not just your 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 doctor patient relationship. Um, all right, so Dr. Trevino started this this conversation, so we're going to go back to him, and it goes back to this idea of, of representation and how you know you could achieve different outcomes if your oncologists or your radiologists or your researchers look, you know, like you. Um, so. Let's talk a little bit more about your thoughts about what could be done in order to diversify the ranks of cancer specialists. I, I feel blessed to have Dr. Trevino and Dr. Tosis and Dr. Shepard on speed dial, right? Because I see you all in the community, right? But not everybody has that opportunity or has that sort of connection. So what, what thoughts would you say that, we, that what could be done in order to diversify the ranks of, of cancer specialists? Yeah, you know, I think that's a that's an incredible question because it's it's got so many variables to that. And so while you could look at everybody and say just study hard, you're going to get there. Focus on one thing and just keep on pushing through. Sometimes um, to get to a level of leadership or a level of success, let's say quote unquote success, based on how you define that, um, is sometimes important to have somebody up top helping you along the way. And so, um, you know, we. We, and I, I like to think that Dr. Tostas, Dr. Shepard, and myself have done have done well. Have done well. I mean, we we've gotten to places where we make an influence somehow. We make an impact, and and we have to conduct ourselves and 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 understand that sometimes it's a matter of turning around instead of always looking forward and realizing that there are a lot of people looking to us for us for that example per se to to say this is who I want to be like, because I didn't want to be a surgeon until I realized what a surgeon was looking at one person 
And the example that 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 got me as a, as a as a young trainee or young medical student, you know, happened to be, you know, that one Latino surgeon that was just amazing. I mean, he was just a good guy, and he and he had gotten to levels that I was hoping to get to, and I could supersede one day, and that was my goal. And so, when we succeed, we always have to turn around and look back. And I think that's the key thing for a lot of us that that get there. Um, is that we have to remember that it's our community, it, it's it's our it's our patients, it's our trainees that really look at us in a certain way, and, and we forget that sometimes, and 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 because we're so focused on the future, and sometimes in some some cases what we're doing and what we're doing for ourselves, we forget that. So the idea of sponsorship, the idea of, of mentorship, all these things are incredibly important, and I think that's what does it. There's studies out there that have looked at this, and they look at the leadership of a particular program. Program. And that leadership of that particular program will funnel students and trainees in that direction. Uh, and that's what they'll do because they say, well, that's a great look at what he's doing. I love it. He's a nationally known figure. I want to be just like him. Um, and we, we do it when we're kids, right? We want to be Superman. We want to be Batman. We want, you know, we want to be, uh, we want to be the Super women too. <laughs> say that. I was about to say that. We want to be. Best. You know, we want to be a queen. But, and so it, it's, it, but that's the example. And as we get older, it's the same thing. Uh, so I, I, I believe in that. And I love, you know, training students and, 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 and residents and, and just getting them to that level and encouraging them to, to focus on, on, on who they are and, and what they promote. And then when they get there, to never forget where they started. And that's the key thing. I agree with that 100%. And it seems like the same, the challenges you have in the medical and scientific field are, aren't that different from what happens in the legal field too, right? You need to build a critical mass of people of color in leadership so people know that it's possible, right? Yeah. And I think I think it's important to know also the pioneers who've done this. And so I love listening to to historical backgrounds of how things people got to where they they got. And I tell this story, and I'll tell it really brief. One of my mentors, one of my dear mentors, um, was a five foot two little Indian guy, and uh, he was along the the time frame of of you know nineteen sixties where you to for you to get somewhere you had to work hard. And he trained at one of the best cancer centers in the world. And he ultimately got got inducted into this thing called American Surgical, which is like one of the best kind of the higher level tier components. And he was the first colored man to ever enter that American Surgical Society because he was a great surgeon, great researcher, great mind, but he was colored. He was the first Indian man, and I would call him colored man walking through the ranks. And there's, uh, there's, there's, there's this thing where he actually did that. And he actually walked along with the first woman to be inducted into the American Surgical, who happened to be a seven foot Swedish woman by the name of Olga Jonasson. And for those of you that know surgery, know that Olga Jonasson was one of the, the best pioneers in surgery and, and, and really kind of was a pioneer for women in surgery in general. And don't forget her name because she's such a, such a, just had made such an impact on women in surgery and, and Dr. Dasgupta made an impact on colors, colored people going into the society. And there's a picture of them where she's seven foot, he's five, four, he's dark and she's white and blonde. And it was just like, but it was, it, that's what they needed to do. Right. And so that's what we're breaking. We're breaking walls along all levels to, to really make an impact. Thank you. For that. Yeah, if I can, Rudine, add okay. something quickly, which is around like um, sort of recruitment and engagement, I guess. Um, I always use this example that when we look at, um, you know, schools and their sports teams, right? Their diversity does not necessarily look like the rest of the school. And why is that, right? Well, that is because they have active recruitment. They actively go out there and seek out that which they want. They seek out the best talent, right? Um, and so in sciences, and I'm sure in law and in many other areas, I think that one of the things that we could do better is just that activate recruitment. It makes me think about, again, mentioning Dr. Wynn, because I had zero interest whatsoever in coming back to academia. I had exited academia over 13 years ago and had zero interest. And Dr. Wynn has this mentality that he calls ABR, which is like always be recruiting. And he is constantly, when you go to a conference, when you have a conversation, you know, he's always like, who did you meet? You know, what is their interest? Are they someone who we can recruit to be a part of our team? 
And I think that um, that kind of mentality is important for all of us. Oftentimes, us as people of color perhaps feel, uh, someone can say, well, that's a that's an increased burden on folks of color to be the ones that are out there recruiting in that manner. Well, again, I'm gonna quote once again, Dr. Wynn, and he said to me once, well, was the Harriet Tubman feel overwhelmed? <laughs> you know, there's, there's you, you know, this one with me before Dr. Tosis. I'm like, Lord. Yes, it is true. <laughs> and so the, the point about it is that, you know, for us to yeah. change the phase in our case of like science and academia, um, you know, we do have to put a little bit more effort um, in. And, and when I say that, I don't say not just us people of color, you know, all of us, right? Because, you know, folks from, from the majority, you know, white folks, for example, can use their power and privilege and influence to also be allies and, you know, help us increase, um, you know, diversity, of course, in these different areas. No, and I'm glad you gave me the, the term ABR because Dr. Wynn is always be recruiting. I think he's even telling me that. And I'm like, I don't even work at VCU Massey, but I'm recruiting, you know? <laughs> you know, I, Sorry, you Dr. Know, so, Sherry, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I like that because one of the things um, that's really important when you, sort of going back to the sports analogy, that sometimes there are beliefs, so kind of going back to the question about bias, that people really may not think that certain groups have a same level of academic rigor or, you know, surgical or clinical capabilities. And so going back to that university example, it just may be that people are very intentional about sports um, because, you know, there, is, there are lots of stereotypes there and they may not, you know, be as intentional to find um, and not just find individuals who are at a certain level scientifically, but to have mentoring to recognize that there are structural factors that exist that does not always give everyone the same access to certain resources in STEM and such. And so what are we doing collectively? So those of us that are around the table, yes, we need to look and mentor and do that work. And, and it's sometimes it is an additional sort of task or burden. However, the institutions that have the power, the influence and the resources can think about how are we setting up these pipeline Right, because at a certain point, we can get people interested if you expose them early um, into that. And then also, again, sort of just question, you know, our structures, you know, the biases that may exist that we may have to just tackle and recognize so that we can identify all this talent that's out there that probably is, has not been identified. I think you're right. Building a more robust pipeline and thinking of ways to do that, I think, is critical to all of this. Um, so, Dr. Tosis is always talking about catchment area. And she even she introduced herself, she mentioned catchment area. Can you tell us in layman ter layman's terms, what is catchment area and why is that important for the work that, that's done at Massey Cancer Center? Absolutely. So, you know, the catchment area at its simplest is just a geographical area where the people we serve come from. So, and for Massey, it encompasses, it's like 66 um, counties of Virginia, 66 localities, because Virginia has counties and independent cities. Um, of the 133 localities that encompass Virginia, it's about 4 million people for, for us, for Massey. And it's kind of like, you know, sort of north, east, south. Um, that, that's sort of what we define. And it's, it's important for a variety of reasons. You know, one, for the purposes of designation, you know, there are thousands of cancer center, only 71 have this prestigious federal designation that is kind of a, a gold standard. And um, we are, as you know, in the process of um, moving towards putting our application towards comprehensive designation. So it is important because it sets the direction, again, our strategic direction right, of, of where our research and our, our service should go to. Um, you know, and this was, this came about in, for many reasons, you know, among them that there are, you know, cancer centers or institutions out there that may be researching, I don't know, and I always, I'm facetious about it and say, you know, the one uvular cancer, you know, because that is their interest when their communities are, you know, dying of preventable cancers like colon cancer or cervical cancer. And so we have a responsibility to look broadly and comprehensively at the people that we serve and see what are their needs and prioritize those needs in our research, um, strategic and engagement agenda. That's pretty much what the catchment is about. 
Awesome. Uh, would you mind sharing a bit about Project Coalesce, which is something that relates to Massey's catchment area and, and tell us you know, what, what that's about? Absolutely. So Project Coalesce is um, you know, a small quality improvement initiative that we started that is um, looking to address systemic, specifically race-related barriers to colon and cervical cancer. So if, if for those out there who know cancer, cancer is many diseases, but there's only five of them that have screenings available, breast, colon, lung, prostate, and cervical. And of those five, there are two that are considered preventable, which are colon, who, which, whose screening is considered preventable, which is colon, because when you get a colonoscopy, they remove the polyp, which is considered precancerous. And the other one is cervical, because the same thing, when you get a PAPS and they remove, or get a colposcopy, they remove that uh, dysplasia, that's considered uh, preventive. So they're highly preventable cancers, um, but there are, of course, barriers to getting those screenings. And so we just talked about how, uh, you know, we need to really start shifting the focus from the individual to the system. And so we know that there are systemic barriers that, um, you know, impact access to these cancers and coalesce partners, you know, brings together federally qualified health centers, which are community clinics that are supposed to provide care regardless of your ability to pay with community organizations together at the table to you know, have conversations and think through what are the most important barriers for that particular community um, for, to access colon and cervical cancer. So we have five FQHCs and five respective community organizations um, across the state of Virginia. It's about 48,000 patients, you know, over a hundred providers and we do quality improvement. So, you know, we go over what are the different requirements for colon and cervical cancer screening. We go over, um, you know, using tools like PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act, uh, you know, fishbone analysis, et cetera, environmental scanning for them to identify a problem and address it in a short period of time to help increase um, access to these screenings. Uh, amazing work. Um, I, I think, we, we, we touched upon this just briefly, but um, could you talk a little bit more about the catchment area data alignment? That's, that's I know you're, you're all about data. You love data, Dr. Tosa. So tell us why this is important. I mean, data obviously, you know, um, is, is one of the ways in which we help inform obviously our decisions. And I think that, you know, when we had our uh, conversation, we talked about data to um, achieve health equity, right? Data to achieve health equity. And so, you know, the first step in that is identifying. So, you know, for the first step in identifying, in addressing a problem is identifying it. And that's what data is supposed to do. And so, um, you know, for, for, for my perspective, you know, looking, when we look at um, this catchment um, area data, I think I, I personally look at it through the health of, lens of health equity. Um, and I think otherwise, one, one of the things that has come about uh, with this team, and it goes back to the conversation with diversity, is that when you have a diverse group of people at the table, that diverse group of people, you know, beyond like the, we talked about the validation, the protection, and the encouragement that you feel when you are surrounded by diverse voices. But, you know, this kind of diversity and representation matters because for those of us, for those of you in business, you probably know about the concept of planned obsolescence, right? Planned obsolescence. And so I think that, um, you know, when, when, you know, when you don't look at things through the length of health equity, and when you look at things in this very unique dimension, um, you know, basically that information becomes obsolete. You, you are planning obsolescence. So, um, you know, health equity and diverse uh, views matter. Um, and that's what we wanna bring to this kind of data conversation. I don't know if that really answered your question, but. No, no, it does, it does. Um, thank you. Um, I seem, I keep getting sort of reminders that I'm, I'm running out of time. So I need to sort of speed up the last bit of this one, but this question's for everybody. Um, the road to health equity, as we talked about, as Dr. Shepard mentioned, it's an aspirational goal, right? Um, from where each of you sit, can you tell me what are the, the road markers that you'll start seeing when you know that we're heading in the right direction for um, health equity. And I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Trevino. I mean, what, what are the signs that we're heading in the right direction? Well, I think uh, the sign is that VCU is leading the way. That's a good sign right there. Oh, VCU. 
let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. I mean, I um, I will tell quickly my story. I I was I was going to sign the contract to come here, and but I was waiting to see who the cancer center director was going to be. That was going to be the mission of the, of the cancer center. Uh, the minute that Dr. Wynn took the position and I had known Dr. Wynn from Chicago, it was it was a done deal for me. Um, you have to have the leadership that wants this. And so I think that the sign is obviously him. Uh, he is he's leading the way. And anybody who knows him understands that he is he's driving this boat and, and he's got a mission. And so um, we we really appreciate uh, his his vision. And, and I think as a as a leader and somebody who has a lot of influence here at the at the cancer center and also at the VCU in general, um, that's that's it. And he's recruiting and he's pushing and he's out there and he's doing what you don't really see a lot of cancer center directors doing. I mean, he's out in the public. Uh, and so that's the sign for me. Um, and as we maneuver forward uh, in this, uh, our mission, and in, 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 in which should be our mission, is to, is to treat the patients in the Richmond area, as well as in, in the Virginians in general, um, of all colors and all races, and, and, and make sure that we are equitable in all levels. And so we're doing that. And I and I'm hoping that uh, the world sees that, and I, I see that uh, that I know that the region will see that now, and then the nation will see that, and then ultimately we're going to lead this. And so I have no question. Five years, we are going to be a very recognizable institution, leading the way as an example for all other cancer centers in the country. So that's where we're headed. Thank you so much, Dr. Trevino. Um, Dr. Shepard, you know, leads you leading the way. What what other markers do you need to see? Um, so I think that we'll see changes in our structure. I think that some of the things that we've talked about where we can just get started, um, that we talked about in terms of who we fund, um, how we fund them. If we say the community matters, then their voice may be embedded in the process of helping to make decisions. Um, because right now, the, some of the processes of the, of the flow of money are different. Um, I think um, the thing I like about Dr. Wynn and one of my former mentors, she said, I heard your cancer center director speak and he's just leaving everybody in the dust because he's bringing in that holistic perspective, right? Talking about things like equity, talking about um, redlining, talking about all these other things that people previously would say are not a part of, of cancer. Um, the other thing I think is a sign is when you see that there are many individuals from diverse backgrounds, when you see that um, and hear people talk about the community, even though they may study mice, you know, so then you know that people have sort of caught, um, caught this understanding that we have to be different. And the thing that I was very um, inspired by in coming here was I felt as if, you know, VCU and the individuals at the Cancer Center were ready for change. And being one of the people that co-chaired the search for the Cancer Center director, and I was still fairly new here, also to me signal that we're thinking about things differently. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Shepard. Dr. Tosis, any other road markers that, that help us you know, inform where we're going on health equity? I think, you know, when we collectively, when you have say in a recruit or us individually, where we're gonna get a product or, you know, the places that we support or sponsor, uh, us as individuals are each demanding, expecting, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, tangible metrics, um, and, you know, tangible um, sort of actions where we see that there is either a move by that entity to integrate um, diversity, equity, and inc inclusion in everything they do. I think for me, when we hold each other accountable for that standard, this is not you know, our race, ethnicity, you know, this group demands this, this group demands that. This is like when, when all of us are really looking at this in an integrated holistic manner. I would say a sign is, you know, last week or maybe two weeks ago when a colleague sent me an email, you know, a white basic science researcher sent me an email asking, I am noticing a difference between males and females in my research. I am not sure if this could be considered a disparity. What do you think? Can we have a conversation? That to me is a sign. It's a really powerful sign. So, you know, I think when we, when we come together in that kind of allyship and broader, uh, you know, elevated thinking, that's a sign that we're moving in the right direction. 
I think you'll agree with me, Dr. Tosis. We'll see it in the data too when things Straight are all online, right? Straight up. <laughs> I was trying not to go there. I was trying I not know, to. But I know, but I'm going to bring us back there. Um, all right. So, Dr. Shepard, I think you're going to get the last word today. Um, I know I am inspired by everyone's work here at Massey, what we've talked about today um, in addressing health disparities. How can we as members of the community sort of help support you and what Massey's doing in your efforts? So with your, your treasure, right? Your time and your talent. <laughs> so um, that's what they say often in church. And so, um, you know, joining us is an advisor or consultant, you know, if there are issues that people observe or experience in the community um, to, you know, let us know the priorities. And it could be an informal way um, when, if there are certain topics that we can bring more of our Massey scientists and experts to the community to give talks, um, you know, that's another way. Volunteering when we go out to health fairs, um, you know, those are some of the ways I think that really would be supportive. Um, and, you know, when it comes to, to treasure, you know, it's not just a monetary issue. It sometimes is really working in partnership. Um, and then we think about at the state level, our policies that we have, you know, maybe working along with us or helping to advocate for change in some policies that we know could be life-saving. You know, the expansion, for example, of the Affordable Care Act really made a difference in um, colorectal cancer. So really thinking as a, as this, as a team uh, on these multiple levels. So it's not just participating in our studies, but that's one way. You know, it's not just making donations, that's one way. But, you know, it's really joining us in this fight um, to, to end, you know, disparities, to achieve equity um, and, and really partnering with us. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Shepard, um, Dr. Estrovino and Tosis um, for joining us for this fascinating discussion. Um, as we continue to make our way to, down that road uh, to health equity, um, I'd like to once again, thank our sponsors, um, Hunt and Andrews Kurth, Dominion Energy, and I'm sorry, I butchered Colonial Downs name earlier, but Colonial Downs and Rosie's Gaming Emporium. Thank you so much for um, sponsoring today's talk. Um, and without a doubt, I'd like to thank all of our webinar attendees uh, for taking the time to listen, uh, to engage and partner with BCU Massey as we do what we can from where we sit to eradicate health disparities. And you know, I'm gonna go back to T'Challa because I love that quote, um, it's back where we, we started. Um, T'Challa said, we must find a way to look after one another as if we were one single tribe. Please remember, all of us, that we're one tribe and we must look after one another. Enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>